We want to take our Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 13, which is our study for this morning, Acts chapter 13. Now, last week we were studying Acts chapter 12, and uh, we enjoyed the story of, of how God supernaturally delivered the Apostle Paul from the murderous intent of King Herod uh, by setting him free from the prison. And now that happened in 44 AD. Now, as we come to Acts chapter 13, Luke jumps forward three years to sometime in the spring of 47 AD, maybe uh, the early months of 48 AD. And he shares with us the story of the special assignment that the Holy Spirit has for the church at Antioch and also for Paul and Barnabas. And so we pick up the story in Acts chapter 12, beginning with verse 25. Follow along with me, if you will. Acts chapter 12, verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Now, this takes us back to chapter 11. You remember in chapter 11, we have the joyous uh, record of the planting of the first Gentile church in Antioch of Syria. And upon hearing it, the elders of the church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas north and Barnabas settled in Antioch and began to teach and disciple the new believers. Now, at that time, Paul had been in his home city of Tarsus in Cilicia, about 150 miles away. And so Barnabas went and brought Paul back to Antioch, and together they were teaching and discipling this new church. Well, a bona fide prophet came up from Jerusalem and revealed to the church at Antioch that there was going to be a severe famine in the Middle East. And probably through the same prophet conveyed to the church in Antioch that the famine was going to be particularly severe in Palestine, in Judea, and around Jerusalem. So, lovingly, the church of Antioch took up contributions for a famine relief fund. And once they had done that, then they sent it by the hands of Barnabas and Paul, who traveled south back to Jerusalem, gave the gift to the Jerusalem church, and they picked up John Mark, whom we met last week in Acts 12, and they returned to Antioch. So that's what verse 25 is about. Now, Paul and Barnabas returned to the church in Antioch in probably 47 AD. Now, as they come back, the Holy Spirit now is going to reveal that he has a special assignment for the church, Barnabas and Paul. We pick that up in verses 1 through 4. Now, there were in the church at Antioch Prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Now, I want to draw your attention to the third page of your notes, if you haven't already identified it. And you might want to just, like, rip it off so that you can hold it beside the text as we're studying. Because this is a great little map that shows you the itinerary of Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey. So Antioch is inland, and what we see is that uh, Seleucia is the port city on the coast. And from Seleucia, they then sailed west to the island of Cyprus. Now, what took place here is that the Holy Spirit spoke to the leadership of the church in Antioch and told them to set apart Paul and Barnabas for this work that the Holy Spirit had them to do. And as we discover, it's their first missionary journey. And 
Though this is descriptive and not necessarily prescriptive of telling us how we must do it, this is consistent with our philosophy here at Grace that if the Holy Spirit calls a member of our church family to cross-cultural missions, he will also call the church. And that it's going to be that it's the responsibility of the elders throughout and down through the whole church family to vet and to train and to support and to make sure those who are called out of our family have everything that they need in order to be successful in the work to which the Holy Spirit has called them. And so that is our philosophy. And we've tried to live that out with the Ingvolstads, the Geddeses, and now with the Condens, uh, who are soon to go as soon as that work permit comes through, right? You got it last night. night. Okay. (laughs) Fantastic. All right. All right. So we're excited about that. Now, another observation here before we go on is that this is one of the clearest passages in all of Scripture that reveals that the Holy Spirit is a person. This is one of the misunderstandings that is prevalent throughout the church, that the Holy Spirit is a force or a feeling. He is not a force. He is not a feeling. He is a person. He is every bit as much a person as is the Father, as is Jesus the Son, The Holy Spirit is a person. He is not an it. He is he. And it is, isn't it interesting as you read the text with me that the Holy Spirit spoke to the leaders of the church at Antioch. Does a force speak? Does a feeling speak? No, a person speaks and he speaks intelligibly. And so it shows that the Holy Spirit has intellect. And when he refers to himself, he uses the personal pronouns I and me. And so, and he also calls them to the work that he has for them. And so the Holy Spirit obviously has will, has intent. And so we see here a very, very clear revelation that the Holy Spirit is a person. He is not an it, not a force, not a feeling. And so we want to be careful to honor the Holy Spirit as the third person that he is of the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, in obedience to the Holy Spirit, the church sends Barnabas and Paul on their way. And we pick up the story in verse 5. When they arrived at Salamis, and if you look there on your notes, that's on the eastern shore of the island of Cyprus, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Now, this is going to be the Apostle Paul's pattern on his missionary journeys. Wherever he goes, he goes into a town and he finds the synagogue, and that's the first place where he tells the story of Jesus of Nazareth. And so we see that he establishes that pattern from the very beginning. So they proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John, that's John Mark, to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Now, Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, he is the Roman appointed governor of the island of Cyprus. And Bar-Jesus has attached himself to the proconsul, like many people do, who attach themselves to people of power. And so this Bar-Jesus, he's also going to be called Elymas, he's attached to the proconsul, And he doesn't want the proconsul to hear the gospel because Elimas then believes that he'll lose influence. He'll lose his place, his status with the proconsul. In verse 8, but Elimas the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, opposed Barnabas and Paul, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Now, before we look at the confrontation that Paul has with 
Bar Jesus. I want to help us understand a very important distinction. With the coming of the new covenant, which was inaugurated at Pentecost 33 AD, when a person trusts in Jesus Christ as their Savior, they're forgiven of all of their sin, and the Holy Spirit of God indwells their lives. You can't be born again without being indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. That's not possible. Paul makes that clear in the book of Romans. So every truly born again believer in Jesus Christ is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, completely indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Now, here, Luke speaks of Saul or the Apostle Paul being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, it's easy to get confused because that sounds like a quantitative uh, expression to be filled, half filled, quarter filled, so on. But that's not the concept. Indwelt means we are fully indwelt by the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God for, all, for the rest of our lives. Being filled is the idea of being under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Paul makes this clear in his teaching in Ephesians 5 where he tells us not to be filled with wine, but to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, praising God and so on and so forth. And he lists what will be the characteristics of a person who is under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But he uses alcohol as a very apt parallel or illustration. What happens when you drink a lot of alcohol? Under what influence do you come? That of the alcohol, and then you do a bunch of stupid stuff that you wish you hadn't done. Okay? So he likens being filled with the Spirit, with being inebriated. When a person comes under the influence of the Holy Spirit, they are in an intimate, responsive relationship following the direction of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Now, can a person be fully indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but not under His influence? Absolutely. That's called being a carnal Christian, one who is still walking according to the flesh and not according to the spirit. We see that in Galatians chapter five. So we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Praise God. He will never leave us. He will never leave us. There's nothing we can do to cause him to withdraw from our lives. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit for the rest of our lives, even if we walk in carnality. But we're the ones who miss out. We're the ones who are going to have to give account at the Bama Seat of Christ. But if we are abiding in Christ, letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly, yielding our will to the will of God, we come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. His fruit is produced in our lives, and then he can move and guide us and direct us, as he did here with Paul. So Paul now is, is, is confronting Bar-Jesus, who is trying to block Sergius Paulus from hearing and receiving the gospel. And Paul says to him under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you son of the devil. <laughs> okay. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. And you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him. And he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had, had, had occurred. For he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now what's interesting here is he was not astonished at the miracle of Bar Jesus' divine uh, discipline. He was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. He was astonished at the story of Jesus of Nazareth. And then when he saw it coupled with supernatural power, that clinched it for him. And that's when he trusted in Christ. And so the point is that the governor of the island of Cyprus trusted in Jesus Christ as a savior. Now, Paul and Barnabas and John Mark move on and they sail to the mainland to a port city called Perga. 
in a province called Pamphylia. We don't know why, but at this point, John Mark obviously uh, bought passage from Perga back down to Palestine, and he left the team. And again, we don't know why, and it caused a rift between John Mark and the Apostle Paul that would take years to heal, but it did eventually heal. And so uh, Barnabas and Paul now are on the mainland in Perga, in Pamphylia. Now, an interesting fact. When you go back to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 is the story of Pentecost 33 AD. Remember, we went into a lot of detail about how significant a day Pentecost 33 AD is. That's when the new covenant was inaugurated. That's when the Mosaic covenant, the Mosaic law came to an end. And now the law of Messiah and the new covenant with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit began. Now, Those who were with the apostles praying, who were indwelt by the Holy Spirit as the beginning of the new covenant, the validation that they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit was through what gift? You can say it out loud. It's okay to say uh, the gift of tongues here at Grace Community Church. We're not afraid of that. The gift of tongues. Now, the gift of tongues is the ability, the divine ability to speak in known human languages that the speaker has not studied. And what's listed there is the many Jews, thousands of Jews. uh, Jerusalem was full because it was one of the seven feasts that they are to celebrate annually. There were thousands who, when they heard this sound that sounded like a mighty rushing wind, they came to where the apostles and the group praying with them were And when they arrived, they heard these Galileans speaking in their native languages. And among those who heard them speaking in their native language were Jews from Pamphylia. And so the Jewish believers, some of those Galilean Jewish believers were enabled by the Holy Spirit as a validation that they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They were able to sing praise, to speak praises of God in Pamphylian. Isn't that interesting? And so those Jewish believers from Pamphylia took that experience back to their home province. So this is where Paul and Barnabas. Now, we're not going to encounter anybody who uh, necessarily necessarily it was there. We don't encounter them. But it's interesting that we see that Pamphylia has already rubbed up against the gospel. So as we continue the story in verse uh, 13, uh, we see that Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos, that's the Cyprus, came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia, which is another province north of Pamphylia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. Now, don't get confused here. We have two cities that are named Antioch. This one is Antioch in the territory of Pisidia in Asia Minor. And then their home church is Antioch in Syria, which is north of Israel. And so per their practice, they go into the Sabbath. Or I'm sorry, they go into the synagogue on the Sabbath. Now, here's an interesting question. When you read the Old Testament scriptures, it was God's intent that his chosen people all live in the promised land. It was his intent that all Jews live in the promised land. And yet, as we saw at Pentecost with all the different territories that were represented there by the Jews who were in town to celebrate the feast, here now Cyprus has synagogues, uh, Pisidia has synagogues. We're going to find them all over. Why are there so many Jewish people living outside the land? Well, the answer to that goes back to 586 B.C., That might ring a bell with some of you. In 586 BC is when the Babylonian Empire 
finally conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the city, destroyed Solomon's temple. And they deported the better part of the surviving citizens. And Babylon did this in order to reduce the possibility of rebellion by conquered people groups, because then they would dilute them by sending them throughout their conquered empire. And this is then is when the synagogue system developed after 586 B.C., because the Jews, recognizing that they had a, a unique, distinct relationship with God, wherever they settled, they stayed as a collective community. And at the heart of that community was the synagogue, and at the heart of the synagogue were the Hebrew Scriptures. And so they remained devout and devoted to the Hebrew Scriptures, and as we have already seen, they also remained connected to Jerusalem. So what happened was, when the Babylonians dispersed them throughout their empire, that's called the diaspora. It's also called the exile. God said through Jeremiah, through the prophet Jeremiah, that this exile would last 70 years. And after the 70 years, then the Jews could come home. Now, 70 years is a generation. And so when the exile came to an end and the, the decree went out that the Jews could return home, very few of them actually returned home. You can read about that in Ezra and Nehemiah. And why was that? Well, because after 70 years, they had settled. They had built their homes. They had built their businesses. They had raised their children and were now enjoying their grandchildren and some of their great-grandchildren. They had built community. They had an identity together with their other Jewish family and friends in the synagogue. And so many of them stayed where they were. And that's why you see throughout Asia Minor, even into Greece, Macedonia, Rome, you see that there are Jewish synagogues everywhere. And that's because of the Jews who did not return after the diaspora. So that's why then Paul goes from town to town, synagogue to synagogue, and he starts with the Jews because they have priority because from them the Savior has come. Now with that, Here's one of the implications. If they, in fact, did stay in, in touch with Jerusalem by going periodically to the feasts, which we know that happened, then they were aware of what was happening in Israel. They were aware of what was happening in Jerusalem. And so Paul, in his presentation of Jesus, as he tells the story of Jesus, to the Jews in Antioch of Pisidia, he assumes they know John the Baptist. He assumes they know John the Baptist. He quotes John the Baptist, assuming they know who he's referring to. Now, what's really important about that is the Jewish people at that time believed John the Baptist was a prophet. That he was a bona fide prophet of the same cloth as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. They believed that when John spoke, he spoke the word of God. Now that's very, very important as we're going to see in Paul's presentation. But if they know John the Baptist, who is John's contemporary? Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. And so if they know John the Baptist, then certainly they know Jesus of Nazareth. And so some of these people, when they went to the feasts, some of them may actually have seen Jesus of Nazareth. They may actually have heard him speak when he taught in the temple compounds at the time of the feast. They certainly would have known Jesus of Nazareth who cleared out the temple compound of Annas's bazaar. All of those animals that he chased out, those, the tables of the money changers that he threw over as he cleansed the temple. You telling me that every Jew throughout the Jewish world didn't hear that? Here was a young Jewish rabbi from Galilee, from the area of Galilee, who finally had the guts to stand up against the high priest 
and his abuses of his office and his defiling of the temple compound. You telling me that the Jewish people all over the world at that time did not know the name of Jesus of Nazareth? Sure they did. Had they not heard that he was crucified by the, by the Romans? Sure. And we assume that they simply accepted the Sanhedrin's explanation for the missing body. What did the Sanhedrin tell the populace happened to Jesus' corpse? Stolen by his disciples. And so we think that Paul assumes that they know all of this and that they accept their leadership's lie about the body, the missing body of Jesus of Nazareth. And so in a sense, as we start out here in verse 15, we have a copy of the manuscript that Paul used when he presented the story of Jesus of Nazareth to a Jewish audience. Isn't that cool? I think this is probably the message that he brought to each of the synagogues that he went to. This is how he presented the story of Nazareth. I don't know if you caught this, but at their commissioning, I prayed for Matt and Janine that the Holy Spirit would show them how to present Jesus to the tribal people that they engage with in Papua New Guinea. I know as I look at at Megan and Jojo, they had a presentation that they... Uh, The creation to Christ is the way that they went about presenting the story of Jesus to the Colombian Tagbanwans on Barangunan Island. You have to, all of us have to, when we tell the story of Jesus, we have to tell it a certain way, right? We've got to figure out a way of communicating it relevantly uh, to the person with whom we're sharing it. And so here we have the joy of actually reading Paul's presentation of Jesus of Nazareth to a Jewish audience. And so here he is with Barnabas at the synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia when we pick up the story in verse 15. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and mentioned and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel, the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance. Now, who, what, who, who is this John? John the Baptist. See, he brings in John that they would be as familiar with John the Baptist as they are with King David. So, before his coming, that is the coming of this promised Savior, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he, he being the the Savior. I'm not the Savior, But behold, after me, one is coming, the Savior is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. When is the Savior coming? After me. Well, John the Baptist was beheaded by King Herod in 29 AD. And so John was prophesying that the Savior would come on the heels 
of the conclusion of his ministry. See, now that historically places where the Savior or when the Savior is going to come. The Savior was going to come in and around 29 AD. When did Jesus' public ministry begin? 29 AD. And it continued until 33 AD when he was crucified. And see, so the testimony of John the Baptist nails, lays down the exact historical time when the Savior would be in the world. And it was in that generation. That's the significance of his testimony. And so he says, there is one who is at when my ministry ends, the Savior will come. And it was in that same year that Jesus presented himself for the first time at the Passover. That's very, very important because it nails down historically when the Savior would come. He goes on. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem... And their rulers, that would be the Sanhedrin, because they did not recognize him. Did not recognize whom? Yes, the Savior. They did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath. They ended up fulfilling them by condemning him. You know, if you've ever read Isaiah 53... That is one of the main points of Isaiah 53. Is that it says, we did not recognize him. Speaking about the coming Messiah. We thought he was a blasphemer. We thought he was being uh, killed as a divine punishment for blaspheming God. We did not realize he was our Messiah. That's Isaiah 53. Prophesied by Isaiah in the 7th century B.C. In their own scriptures. It says he would not be recognized. He would be rejected. And he would be murdered. And the Sanhedrin. Unwittingly because they didn't recognize Jesus of Nazareth as the Savior. Fulfilled Isaiah 53. To a T. That's Paul's point. That they did not understand the utterance of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. So again, that's proof positive. Who was the one that they condemned? Jesus of Nazareth. Who was the one that they manipulated Pilate to murder? Jesus of Nazareth. And so John says, the Savior is going to come right at the end of my ministry. Jesus comes in 29 AD. In 33 AD, what does the Sanhedrin do? They fulfill Isaiah 53. They don't recognize him. They reject him. And they have him executed by Pilate. I mean, it couldn't be clearer that Jesus is the one promised clear back to King David. Paul goes on to say, And though they found no guilt, found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, which are now his witnesses to the people. We saw that in Chapter 1, how many days was Jesus seen? 40 days after his resurrection, he was seen. He was seen, Paul says, by over 500 men at one time, at one event. And so this is no small thing that was, that was hidden away. Jesus was out there and seen for 40 days, the resurrected Jesus. I mean, that's incredible, incredible eyewitness testimony. To the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And we bring you the good news. That what God promised to the fathers. This has he has fulfilled to us their children. By raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead. 
no more to return to corruption. He has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. And what he's quoting is Psalm 16. And in Psalm 16, it says to God, you will not let your holy one see corruption. Now, the reader would say, well, does that refer to King David? Because King David is the anointed one. He also could be the one understood to be the holy one will not see corruption. What is corruption? It's the decay of the human body, the dead human body when it's in the grave. And Paul points out David died, right? And David was buried. And what happened to his physical body? It decayed. It saw corruption. And so Psalm 16 can't be about King David. Okay, because he didn't fulfill it. But who did fulfill King David's prophecy in Psalm 16? Who was the one who was raised from the dead? Jesus. And did you also catch, let's go back. So it says in verse 34, and as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. It's very important. No more to return to corruption. Lazarus was ra resurrected by Jesus, right? Did, did Lazarus die again? Yes. And so after his second death, did his body see corruption? Yes. Did it uh, decay in the grave? Yeah, it did. All those, like the, uh, the daughter of Jairus, uh, who Jesus resurrected from the dead. She lived, but she died again, and her body saw corruption. Notice this says that he was raised no more to see corruption. What does that mean? Will Jesus die a second death? No. So his resurrection is distinct from all other resurrections in the scriptures because his resurrection was to eternal life. He will no more die again. That sets him apart from all other resurrections that have occurred. Now, this is in fulfillment of David's prophecy that you will not allow the Holy One to see corruption. And so now Paul is going to bring it to a close. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, through Jesus of Nazareth, who fulfills all these prophecies, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Because Isaiah 53 makes it very clear that he was dying, not for any sin of his own, but he was dying to pay the penalty for the iniquities and trespasses of his people. Verse 39, And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. And this harkens back to remember Stephen's presentation and what was his accusation of the Sanhedrin? That they always resist the Holy Spirit and they always resist the changes God brings in his program and they murder the men who reveal that change. Here he's talking about the same thing. What has God done? God has done an amazing change. He has brought the Savior. The Savior died on the cross and paid the penalty for all man's sin. That had never happened before and it will never happen again in human history. And then he raised him from the dead. And he's saying that is the work that even if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. But don't be like the scoffers who don't believe. Believe it. Because by it you will be saved. Don't be like your rulers. Believe the evidence that I'm presenting to you. But as you can imagine, as always, wherever the gospel is preached, there's a mixed response. On the one hand, in verses 42 through 44, we read about those who received this message with joy. Look in verse 42, as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. 
And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Can you imagine the joy? Paul and Barnabas must have spent the entire day and evening talking and from the scriptures and teaching these people the full story as they just drank it up like milk. And then we read in verse 44, the next Sabbath, the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> Can you imagine what that week was like? From sun up to sundown, Paul and Barnabas had the joy of discipling all of these new believers and teaching them the word of God. And just seeing the aha moments, people getting it, their lives transformed, marriages beginning to be healed. Lives changed from the inside out as people were indwelt by the Holy Spirit and he began to work in their lives. Oh, would have been awesome to be in Antioch and Pisidia during that week. But as always happens, the wicked human heart gets in and messes it up. And we see those in verse 45. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Excuse me. For the Lord, for so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you might bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And so here are the main points of, of Paul's presentation to a Jewish audience. First, God promised a savior from King David's line. Second, the prophet John the Baptist testified the Savior was coming on the heels of John's ministry. So that sets it historically. Number three, by rejecting and executing Jesus of Nazareth, their Jewish rulers actually fulfilled prophecy, which proves Jesus of Nazareth is the promised Savior. God raised Jesus of Nazareth, number four, from the dead in fulfillment of prophecy, in fulfillment of King David's prophecy in Psalm 16, and in fulfillment of his promise to King David. Number five, Jesus of Nazareth is the promised Savior through whom there is the forgiveness of sins. And then number six, his appeal that they would believe on Jesus of Nazareth and be saved. My brothers and sisters, this is as relevant to us today and the reason for us to believe in Jesus of Nazareth, that he is the promised Savior, that he fulfills these prophecies to a T. And as a result, we can put our trust in him, that his death on the cross paid the penalty for all of our sins, past, present and future that he was buried and that on the third day he rose again, God showing that he or demonstrating that he accepted Jesus's payment on our behalf. And he raised Jesus from the dead. And the promise is all of us who trust in him, all of us who want a relationship with God and realize that our sin separates us from God. Now you understand that Jesus is the solution. Jesus took your place. Jesus suffered your punishment. He paid the penalty in full so that by faith in him, you could be forgiven of all of your sins. The Holy Spirit of God will come to live in your life and your life will begin to change from the inside out as you now have a living relationship with God in heaven. 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If I can help you in that process, I'll be here after the service. I'd love to talk to you more. You may have a friend who brought you today. They would love to tell you more about how you can be saved and be right with God. Let's pray together. Oh, Holy Spirit, we praise you for the word that we have studied today, that Jesus of Nazareth is the promised Savior. And through him, we have the forgiveness of sins. Through him, we have new life through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That he is the Savior for all time and eternity. And it is only by him that we can be made right with you. We cannot do anything in our own power. There are no works that we can do to add to what Jesus has accomplished. You poured out your righteous anger on him on the cross. And our sin is forgiven. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would draw any here this morning who are not yet trusting in the Lord Jesus, that you would draw them a step closer to him through hearing these truths about who Jesus is. I pray this in his name. Amen.